My name is Phil White, I'm Chief Architect at Scale Computing, and uh, this is uh, how does HC3 storage work? Um, in other words, Scribe. Scribe is our storage technology, so I'll be going through that in detail. Uh, I'm going to give uh, just kind of a, a brief overview and then get into some of the concepts. Uh, architecture diagrams I think will be pretty useful for you guys, and then we can go into some details, and we can definitely talk more details if anyone has any uh, very specific questions as well. So. First things first, though, I want to say that SCRIBE is an acronym, and it stands for Scale Computing Reliable Independent Block Engine. Uh, the key thing here being that it is a block engine. It's a block device. Uh, it's, it's not a file system. It's not an object store. Uh, we, we produce a consistent block device for virtual machines. <coughs> and uh, just kind of uh, as a brief overview, SCRIBE was built from scratch for virtualization. I mean, our use case here is, is QEMU um, virtual machines, and we <laughs> looked at that and, and wanted to build the, the best storage engine we could for pr that particular use case. We have to provide consistency. These are block devices. We have to have immediate consistency guarantees, and uh, that's what Scribe does. It has no single point of failure, uh, uh, for obvious reasons, and uh, scalable in performance and capacity. So as you add nodes, your performance increases because you're adding spindles and your capacity increases as well. We have no third-party dependencies. This is not, um, you know, kind of a, a piece together a mishmash of open source technologies. This scribe was developed entirely in-house. It's a modular design as well, as you'll see. Um, there's a lot of components that are very easy to change out. Uh, can, configurations can change. Different components can run side by side in different configurations and uh, that turns out to be very useful. It's also 100% user space. Uh, we're not really interested in uh, providing proprietary kernel modules to people who like to run with a stock, clean, uh, you know, stable Linux kernel. And uh, lastly, I want to mention we do extensive automated testing on Scribe. One of uh, our most important beliefs around here is that we, we test absolutely everything in an automated fashion. Every code commit has to have tests along with it. And that's we actually very carefully enforce that. We use, uh, with our code review process, uh, we require that and code reviews will, be, will fail if you don't have tests with your commit. So um, we hold pretty true to that. I want to briefly mention what Scribe does not do because these are some of the uh, sort of initial design choices we made uh, for various reasons uh, in, in looking at other technologies out there and and uh, made some decisions. And it, in the first item here being objects on top of a file system. You know, there, there's a lot of storage technologies that will place, uh, it essentially are doing allocations and things on whether it's ext4 or ButterFS. And um, you can get into some interesting uh, bottlenecks and performance situations with regards to uh, uh, f-sync behavior in, in a file system, especially on freshly allocated files. Um, you know, those sorts of operations tend to sort of spider out and pretty soon you're syncing the whole world when you don't want it to be. Um, we, use the, we use block devices uh, via the Linux nati native AIO interface and uh, avoid the file system entirely so we don't have that extra layer in there. We don't <coughs> implement a full POSIX file system. Obviously, we don't do that. We're not a, we're not a file system. We're a block device. Uh, but, you know, there are uh, some solutions. And, and again, you know, we used to ship GPFS in our product. Uh, and that is a POSIX file system. It's very, um, you know, very complex, and doing that in a cluster, uh, you, you do run into issues. And we don't do that. So we ha we have a block device, which turns out to be much much simpler. Yeah, but does, doesn't KVM map virtual disks to files? Well, we've actually modified KVM. We've 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 written a block driver, a native block driver for QEMU that okay. uses Scribe, so you don't have to map directly to a file. We do not have some of the ugly recovery scenarios uh, that uh, are, can be typical in Linux clusters with partitioning failures and things like that that you know, essentially require manual involvement. We, don't, we, don't, we, we can't be doing that. We have uh, you know, an appliance we're shipping, and this sort of thing has to be automated. Administrative complexity, uh, we can definitely avoid that because um, you know, we're, we're targeting our use case. We're creating a block device uh, for a virtual machine. And uh, that should be very simple, and uh, we've, made it, we've made it so. 
kernel modifications, again, I mentioned we were not in the business of creating proprietary kernel modules. We don't want to uh, you know, mess around with that. We want to run it with a stable, as a stable a kernel as possible. And we do not have a rigid data placement. If you change your cluster configuration, you're not going to have to rebalance data and move stuff around you know, in some massive operation. Um, you know, our data placement is very flexible, as you'll see. So I want to move ahead and talk about some concepts that uh, you're, you're going to hear a lot of and we're going to be throwing around, um, RSDs and VSDs. An RSD is a, a real device, a real scribe device, a real storage device. Uh, these are essentially the disks that are attached to our nodes. We call them RSDs, and they are actual hardware. And uh, scribe can actually use any block device for this. It can even use files, which we only use for testing. But uh, typically, this is an actual hardware device. And uh, we obviously assume that is an unreliable device. And the VSD being the virtual device. This is what we're presenting to a VM as a block device. It is reliable. We, we implement that reliability through a VSD driver, which we'll cover. The scribe instance, we call it, uh, is really just a, a daemon process. It run, we run one of these per node. Um, and uh, you know, the instance being that particular instantiation of it. And when it, if, uh, if uh, a, a node were to go down and then come back up, that would be a brand new scribe instance. The previous instance is now gone. Um, it makes some things easier with regards to leasing of, of virtual devices. You know the lease is expired because the instance that created it is now actually gone. And scribe clients are really just anything that's connecting to a VSD. In our case, it's mostly QEMU, but I, I'm leaving this up there as an example. You can connect pretty much anything that can use a block device. Even uh, you know, SQLite has a VFS layer. We've actually built a, uh, an integration to Scribe, so it's very easy to just run a SQLite database on top of a VSD, and that's available now via the cluster. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. And we do all that via a component we call libscribe. It's just a C API, basic block device semantics. So you can really just link that into any application that you want to present one of these block devices to. And within the scribe daemon, we have a few components. There's the VSD drivers I'll talk about in detail. There's an RSD layer, which is really responsible for communicating to all the disks in the cluster. We also have a cluster map, which is very important. It provides clustered consistency and root metadata support. Libscribe, I mentioned, is our, our uh, library. And uh, our QEMU block driver. This is the part of QEMU that we modified so that we're able to support native connections to scribe. Uh, command line tools, uh, including you know, our own SC uh, command line, which I'll show you in a moment, and uh, as well as QEMU command line tools. Since we've developed this as a native uh, component to QEMU, those sorts of things just work out of the box. And our, uh, we have provisioning and monitoring APIs as well. So this is uh, sort of an architecture diagram. Think of this as being one node. And uh, you know, you'll see there's some VMs in the upper right corner there. Uh, you have QEMU with a guest VM running in there. Each one is uh, running on some virtual drive that's been provisioned. On the left side here, we have uh, what we call ScaleD. This is our daemon process that runs the state machines and collectors that we saw earlier. And uh, it integrates directly via APIs with Scribe for provisioning, monitoring, management, uh, mostly. And then uh, the scribe daemon itself. So how this works is we have what we call the libscribe server, which has a clients will connect to it over a Unix socket. And this is not a data path connection. This is really just sort of um, a control connection. When IOs are performed, there is a message that gets sent over that connection. And um, that message is communicated to a VSD driver, which is then responsible for actually scheduling the IO. The, I, the data path itself actually happens over shared memory. The libscribe component that's linked in with the QEMU guest is handling all these shared memory operations transparently, which is nice as well from, in, you know, if you're going to integrate something else with libscribe, you don't have to worry about setting up shared memory. It, that's handled for you transparently. And that memory then gets shared among the scribe client, in this case, a QEMU VM, <coughs> as well as a scribe daemon and the Linux kernel, because we're actually going to be submitting IOs locally straight from that shared memory buffer. So there's no data copying involved from daemon to daemon. Uh, you know, you, you essentially have uh, 
an IO being submitted, the kernel gets that exact buffer. It's already it's aligned uh, properly for IO directly to the device. The IO gets performed, and uh, you know the, the IO is then completed over the uh, the libscribe connection. Does that mean you could put so other data services within there? Because because that's sitting in shared memory, and you've got a daemon who can look at that. Does that mean you could build other things into that? Build. I'm sorry, I well, couldn't quite hear you. Well, you build other other functionality into that at that point because you've got shared access to that data. Oh yes, as far as transforming the data or yes. something along those lines. Yes. Yeah. Things, yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going to dig into into the, the scribe daemon here a little bit, and we'll talk about what's inside there. Um, Could I throw a quick question in? Absolutely. Um, as I see as I see this, I see certain similarities to things like Ceph. Do you see any? Why why build your own other than the fact that probably five years ago Ceph wasn't quite up to speed or other Ceph other storage infrastructure like this? Because it isn't up, it isn't up to speed. <laughs> yeah, now that's either, actually it? we have actually taken a close look at Ceph as well. Um, you know, we've met the development team. We actually worked with them for a while. Okay. Um, and and that was a few years ago. You know, they. Um, there were some quality concerns at the time for, for us, um, as well as the, 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 um, what I had mentioned before about having objects on top of file systems. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, ultimately, we decided to, to build our own for those reasons. And, and okay, that makes sense. So digging into this, uh, this scribe daemon, uh, again, I, I mentioned it's C++ user space. There's three main components in here. The cluster map, which is this clustered consensus engine, the RSD layer, and the VSD drivers. So the cluster map. In order to do this correctly on a cluster, you need somewhere to store your root metadata. You can't just store it on one disk or something like that. If that becomes unavailable, you need it needs to be everywhere so you know where to start looking for a VSD. Uh, you also need some way to know that you have this concept of quorum that I, if you decide that you're going to mount a VSD, you're going to bring up a VM that's connected to this VSD, you better get agreement in the cluster that you're the only one doing that. Otherwise, you're going to have really uh, bad stuff happen. So the cluster map is what's responsible for, for giving us that guarantee. Um, you know, there are uh, things out there like, like uh, you know, Zookeeper and other solutions that operate as sort of standalone, and, and those are somewhat complex systems. Um, you know, we decided to go with a homegrown solution. This is a simple in-process solution that runs and uh, implements uh, the Paxos consensus protocol. Um, so this, this cluster map is based on what we call PDU peer, and that's going to come up again. PDU peer is uh, an, another internal technology of ours, which is really just a transport over TCP that lets us easily and quickly define different uh, protocol data units that we can move around and uh, it's very easy for us to use. So we've based a lot of technologies off PDU peer. But this, this cluster map is really what's providing us uh, this sense of clustered locking in Scribe and this enforcement of quorum. The RSD layer is what's giving us access to all of the disks in the cluster. Every node can talk to any other disk in the cluster and, and read and write data. Provides reliable communications. Again, this is a, another technology that uses our PDU peer technology. And the, the important thing you need to know here is that when a media error occurs or there's a disk error on a remote node, we pass that through, we pass that exact type of error all the way through this protocol so that the VSD driver, the layer above, is aware that that was an actual media error and we can take whatever action is necessary through that configuration of that VSD. One interesting thing about the RSD layer and the protocol involved as well is that we've integrated reference counting. So this is a little bit of a departure from a standard uh, you know, storage protocol uh, such as iSCSI or something like that. But we, we've done that uh, to actually eliminate a round trip over the network as well. So when you perform a write, the RSD layer is actually tracking the reference counts and will uh, be aware of, of whether or not a redirect on a write has to occur. And that, gets ha that happens and the new extent of the, the new location of the data actually comes back with the response uh, as part of the RSD layer. So that's uh, a, a, an interesting optimization that we've made there. So digging in a little bit deeper, um, there's two implementations of 
that exist in this RSD layer. They both provide the exact same interface from a, from a software perspective uh, and, and very simple operations. You can read, you can write, you can allocate space, or you can update reference counts. And reference counts are what are used for, to implement snapshotting and cloning. And the RSD local is responsible for talking to local disks, so it's a little bit simpler than the remote implementation, which is going to talk to remote disks. Each device will have one of these objects instantiated, and this is what is actually handling all of that allocation and reference counting. And one of the things we do is we actually cache those allocation maps in RAM. So anytime an allocation occurs or uh, checking whether a copy on write has to occur, that's an in-memory lookup, so it's very low latency. Additionally, um, within the RSD local, this is the, the component that is actually issuing all of the I.O. to the Linux kernel via the Linux native AIO interface. The remote implementation, which is identical to the local implementation from an, an internal view, is uh, what's giving us access to all these remote disks uh, over something we call RSD remote protocol. So this is kind of an architecture diagram. Um, you know, obviously, you'll have local disks. Imagine this is actually two nodes here, uh, the scribe daemon on node one and on node two. So two disks on each node. We actually instantiate an RSD interface internally in the daemon for every single disk in the cluster. And we put a remote implementation behind those remote disks. So this is actually transparent to the, any, of the, any user of these, of these disks. And that's implemented through this, uh, these green lines in the <coughs> center are essentially these RSD remote protocol connections. So you can imagine these VSD drivers that have come up inside uh, these two demons. And uh, what they are actually going to be doing is communicating directly with these RSDs. And the VSD itself doesn't have to be aware of whether it's talking to a local disk or a remote disk. There's obviously some, a some attributes of these RSDs it needs to know about, like what failure domain is the RSD in. Uh, so it, that it, it can actually pick the correct RSDs to talk to. But the idea being that the data path essentially will, will follow this flow where, you know, talking to RSD1, you're going to be doing a, just strictly a local connection that's going to take advantage of that shared memory path and go straight through to the kernel and do the write. The remote connection is actually going to be using our PDU peer connection uh, to a uh, remote IO target, which is just sort of proxying that write to the local RSD on the remote instance. So is the data RAID protected or replicated or? It is. As, so that's actually entirely up to what? the VSD. It's replicated or? It, it's up to the VSD. So the VSD so can be configured to be replicated or, or RAID? So the protected. RSDs themselves, do. there's no protection, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no replication. The VSD, depending on what implementation of VSD you're using, all we're doing here is providing these raw disks to the VSD implementation to use it as it sees fit. You're just providing the framework. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. So what possibilities do you have for the VSD for uh, data protection? So or, is that, or are you going to get to that? We're going to get to that <laughs> shortly. Yeah, we we'll talk about the VSDs. Um, so I kind of already mentioned some of this about RSD remote protocol. It's implemented on top of our PDU peer, which is TCP streams based. Um, it's similar to iSCSI, um, you know, request and response PDUs, pretty standard storage protocol stuff. Um, and we have all the requests only take a single round trip. And uh, we want to minimize that IO latency. And so that includes unsolicited or immediate, <coughs> immediate data on writes we've immediately Excuse followed me. with data PDUs. Yes. I have a question on the previous slide. Back a slide? Yeah. Yeah. And so you are. Uh, you have a physical RSD and remote RSDs, okay, in the, the, the blue and the green ones. If I have a huge cluster of 20 nodes and mm -hmm. each one of them has uh, five, uh, uh, five disks, so the total of uh, demos that run on uh, one machine are 100? Actually, no. This, so the scribe daemon itself is a single daemon. Ah, okay. These RSDs are actually just objects that live inside ah, okay, the daemon. Okay, okay. So th there's a, a small amount of memory that gets allocated for each one of these. Okay, so the consumption of resources is not huge. Yeah, you could probably have you know thousands of these things, and it, it, okay. would, it wouldn't be a really issue. So, so you're just managing those as separate threads within the same daemon, effectively. 
you need to give exactly. them. But, but the memory overhead, I guess, is, yes. is not massive because of that. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, there are separate threads that manage uh, each one of these RSDs. Um, you know, that's configurable. The IO manager internally has a thread. Um, and then uh, the remote RSDs, actually, there's a thread pool, which is right. configurable depending on how many IO is outstanding and, and that sort of those sorts of things, you know, can be, can be changed, so. And the scale is pretty well known. They know how many disks are going to be in a box and how many boxes are going to go out in a standard cluster. Well, yeah. So you can, you can test very well for that, you know. That's eight correct. machines, eight disks you're probably only going to have uh, 64 RSDs. Exactly. Yeah, th so that's something where you know, the, the tuning and testing with different scenarios is, is uh, kind of it limits uh, how much testing we have to do with the fact that we know what hardware we're shipping on. Mm -hmm. It's a good case for not having the software-only product as well. Because <laughs> yeah. you get somebody who does that uh, you uh, know, 48 drives exactly. and puts 100 machines together, suddenly your product keels over and they're mad. Yeah. You essentially have limitless configurations if you're shipping a, a software product. So yeah. That. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, <coughs> move on to the VSD. This is really kind of the interesting stuff. Um, you know, this the VSD is a virtual storage device. Uh, is essentially implementing this interface, which is really the QEMD block driver API. That's that was our target use case. So that's kind of where we started, and. Uh, so uh, the VSD, uh, any VSD implementation must inter implement this interface. So it's, it's you know, obviously standard block semantics uh, it, with the addition of uh, snapshot creation, deletion, and management, uh, as well as discard. So what the VSD layer does is it gives you this ability. You see, we, we've got this framework. We've got all these RSDs that are accessible. And you can now take uh, and, and create a heterogeneous mix of different implementations different configurations of VSDs. I can run a VSD that's doing two-way replication or, or two, two copies of data versus three copies of data. Those can run side by side. Each one of these has full access to the exact same RSDs and they can share data. So just, just as a side effect there, Phil, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Does that mean you can have, um, you could, you've got the potential in that architecture to have disparate nodes? So if you decide to, to, to allow mixed nodes in the future because the RSDs are dealing with only the, the storage that belongs to them, you could then allow yourself to, to import a, an, another node that's not of the same size, so you can start Absolutely. Doing that, migrate a node in, take a node that's out. That's some of the flexibility that we, that we would like to provide, is those different size drives and different yeah. size nodes. Um, you know, we're, we'll get into what we call... Today. Yeah. Right. yeah, the placement spec is what, is what allows us to do that. That's a component uh, I'll cover in a moment here. Um, and uh, actually, was there... Okay, so kind of a diagram of, of how this actually does all play out. You know, you have uh, these different virtual machines that are running side by side, uh, which might have multiple, uh, you know, different VSDs attached to them running completely different configurations or completely different implementations. You might have, uh, you know, VSD A could be doing three-way replication. VSD B could be using a ratio. <coughs> you know, so that's, that's something that, uh, you know, is, is very flexible and very valuable. <coughs> Does it also mean that I if you decide to implement deduplication or compression, you need to implement it at uh, the VSD level so it can be global? Exactly. Yeah, and and it's interesting. There's a, there's a side effect as well of cloning is that you can, uh, you know, if you have a VSD and you clone it, you effectively created a clone that's already got that deduplication kind of built in. VSDs, th the fact that th because the, the reference counting is done at the RSD layer. Uh, VSD clones, you can have different configurations on them and, and they can share the same data among multiple different VSDs. So if I, if, if I have VSD A and I say I want three replicas and I have VSD B, which is a clone of it, and I say I want two replicas, it's going to create how the maximum number, right? Yeah, you'll have three replicas for the for the for VSD A, but once VSD B starts changing data and, and the you know you start to get the redirect right blocks right, that become right. unique on VSD right. B will only, only have, have two, two replicas. Ones. Yeah. As long as you later it deletes the VSD that had the three replicas, reference count could be deleted. Exactly. Deleted. It's all based basic yeah. reference counting, so yeah, you'll okay. get that effect. Yeah. And and your you could use erasure coding is theoretical, right? Yes. <coughs> yeah, that's actually I've. 
started playing with some of the, uh, the technology lately, and I, I would love to see you know, erasure coding VSD, uh, but it's a, probably a ways off. You would, you'd need to implement the log ahead of it, because yeah. random rewrites into... Would kill you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, it would, be, it would be useful for data that's not really going to be changing much, and... Yeah. Uh, Cause it, right, you know, which is which is why it makes sense there. Storage overhead goes way down, but you know it's right. But yeah. but the truth is, if you you know if you if you build a log based structure mm -hmm. above it, it's okay. And you're you know if you accumulate enough data before you write it, it'll work. Yeah, interesting. But you know that that becomes part of the SSD story. Yes. So as we saw, uh, you know, each RSD gives you this allocation mechanism, and uh, you know, it's up to the VSD which RSDs it wants to place data on. So the question being, how do, how do we pick what RSDs we're actually going to use? Uh, and that's where we uh, have a component come into play called the placement spec. And uh, it, this is basically a component that is it's interchangeable. You can put different placement specs in with any VSD. You can configure them as well. And what it's doing is it's letting the VSD pick a set of RSDs to use for any particular I.O. Anytime you're allocating data, anytime I'm uh, recovering from errors, uh, you can consult the placement spec and say, where should this data be placed? It's like preferentially treats local disk over remote and that sort of thing. That's, yeah, that sort of thing would be encoded into this particular yeah. placement spec. There's many parameters available to the placement spec. So, you, you know, pretty much... Uh, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios you can imagine that, uh, you know, for example, if you have a particular hotspot of a VSD and you want to place that on SSD versus uh, rotating media, you can do that because that, that information is available. The VSD, the placement spec, will know what type of all these RSDs are. What failure domain is obviously very important. If you're making two replicas, you want to make sure they lie in different failure domains so you're not susceptible to uh, a particular failure. Uh, you know, the size and current allocation, this comes into play when you have different sized uh, nodes. And uh, you, you might have two terabyte disks in one node and one terabyte disk in another node. You need to actually look at how these things are being utilized when you're deciding where you're going to place data. IOPS information is collected, and that's available to the placement spec. You know, is, is there, for whatever reason, this disk is just getting hit way too hard Let's slow down the, our placement of data on that. On the that data is not necessarily striped across all the disks. It's li literally, you know, assigned to a particular RSD, and if it's replicated, it's double there or something like that. Yeah. So the VSD, it's entirely up to the placement spec where to place data, yeah. and it's up to the VSD to decide if it wants how many replicas it wants. Right. Then it has to make that many picks of RSDs to place data. So, so once once a um, I'll call it an allocation is made. Mm -hmm. That decision is pretty much static until there's a uh, disruption of the disk or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you want to trigger a migration or a recovery manually. Right. Um, you know. Like you can change the placement spec and then. <coughs> exactly. <coughs> yeah. If you decided you wanted three replicas or you wanted to, uh, right. You know, place this particular device entirely on SAS or, or SSD. Uh, you know, so can multiple VMs share the same RSD? I mean. Oh, absolutely. Can multiple VSDs share the same RSD space? Multiple VSDs share this. Yeah, you can have thousands of VSDs on 12 RSDs, right? So it's essentially sharing the same, they all share the same pool of storage, uh, but they all make their own decisions where to place data. So what are you actually placing when you you'd say, like, here's a placement spec for 1K chunks, 1 meg chunks? We, we have 1 meg chunks. 1 meg so chunks. Okay. That's what we test with as well. So we're, we're pretty much shipping straight across the board 1, okay. one meg chunks. So for every new 1 meg chunk, you do a placement spec call? Okay. Correct. Yes. Pre-placement is also kind of important. Um, you know, when we do a recovery, we call into the placement spec and say, okay, give us a sane placement for this data. By the way, there's already two replicas over here. Don't change the entire placement, right? That's important. You don't want to move all your data around in a recovery scenario. So uh, that's something that can be taken into account. So some of the things that I've I kind of already been mentioned, I think, uh, you know, some like a locality-based placement spec, uh, you know, the location of what virtual machine is performing this I.O. Uh, is very useful to the placement spec. Uh, wide striping, we want to spread data over 12 RSDs, not just, uh, you know, keep things local. Or balancing our usage among the cluster, making sure that we don't 
overwhelm one node versus another one, or some combination of the, of the above. I mean, you can, um, you know, th these sorts of things are very, the placement spec is, the, the code is very simple itself, so, um, and, and given all the data that's available to so it. So these are something that the user UI at level uh, would see, or this is something we you're don't implementing expose it at yet. your level? It's or? In, in, entirely at our level. Uh, we have control so over So you could do whatever stuff. you want here. And, right. and do you actually select, the, so these all four are available to a, a running system now, and you would select one based on, you know, what load is going on? We only have on? two available to a running system now. One of them, uh, the one we're shipping with now, uh, at least in beta, and we'll, we'll likely release is, um, just essentially does wide striping, kind of just round robins and over it. Um, we will shortly be releasing one, I think, that adds a little bit of um, randomness as well as paying a very close attention to the usage, relative usage of each RSD. Um, so as we develop this system, we'll be building more, uh, more intelligent placements as well. And you'd have some sort of way of deciding what, what to use on, a, on, on the a fly. Yep. On the fly as, as uh, the VSD requires additional space? Exactly. And these are all thin provision kind of environments? Yes, VSDs are uh, thin provision. So when you, when you create a VSD, uh, you create a terabyte VSD, it's gonna, um, you know, nothing is actually allocated at that moment. It allocates uh, once the first writes occur. So I think this question has already come up as well, but you know, it, the placement spec gets consulted during initial allocation. During error handling, if a write fails, um, you know, it will ask, okay, where, what's the second location we can place this data? Recovery, uh, you know, if, if a disk has disappeared or a node goes down, um, you know, we, we will actually look at the entire VSD and just essentially scan the metadata and, and decide, okay, for every placement where, you know, which ones of these are now invalid, which placements need to be fixed. And then migration uh, is something we may add in the future. You can trigger it manually now via a recovery, but, um, you know, just basically triggering the VSD to reconsider all of its placements uh, is what would allow you to do some sort of migration from uh, through different classes of storage. You mentioned Flash. You actually have a system that supports Flash today, or, or we don't. We, d we do not uh, ship any systems with Flash today. Not that we're marketing. It'll be built in and run. I mean, again, it's a storage device. We can put bits on it. We we haven't found anybody in our market that wants to pay for you know an all Flash device or. Today we currently have a couple VSD implementations. Um, the first one, though, is really just was kind of our prototype, so we don't actually use it anymore. But uh, the idea being, you can create a simple VSD that doesn't do any sort of data protection, <laughs> no replication, write one copy of the data, and good luck. Uh, obviously, that's not safe. But reliable VSD is our production implementation, so we'll be talking about that one. <clears throat> so obviously, no single point of failure, and we say n-way replicated data and metadata, n up to 16. 16 is obviously completely extreme, and uh, <laughs> but you can do it. <laughs> um, I had to pick a number, I guess. 16 seemed low, but it's actually quite high. Um, metadata checksumming, optional data checksumming. Performance is actually really poor on 16, by the way, as well. <laughs> Well, I would think read performance would be okay. Oh, yeah, reads <laughs> real fast, but uh, yeah. <coughs> not so much with writes. <laughs> okay. No. Um, okay, talk about data checksums for a second. Yeah. So you're talking about... So data checksumming... Integrity checksums? Yes, that is not uh, actually implemented yet. But the, the metadata checksumming... Yeah, <laughs> this is actually a, an old slide, but uh, the optional data checksumming uh, will be implemented similar to the metadata checksumming. Um, we don't ship with, with data checksumming today, though. Instant snapshots and cloning. Um, that's uh, very important for us. We don't want to make a, a huge copy of the, of the data. The difference between snapshots and clones, one's rewritable and one's readable. Exactly. The snapshots uh, get, get taken, and then you can promote a snapshot into a clone. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. and, and you're going to dig into that mechanism, right? Uh, I'm told that I have five minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You'll be lucky. I would love to dig into that mechanism, maybe afterwards. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's auto magic. Mm. Yes. Dig into it over here later. There you go. Um, so, you know, the metadata here is actually fairly lightweight. Given we're doing one meg blocks, it lets us do, we can cache all of the metadata, and, uh, you know, which, which makes it, this thing go pretty fast, um, especially on writes that don't have to update metadata, which once a, 
once a VSD has been allocated, we don't need to update metadata. Does the metadata support the same re replication level as the data then, effectively? So the VSD says two replicas, you go out two replicas of the metadata. Yes, we, we tie those together right now. <coughs> and if you really hate yourself, you could do 16 replicas of the metadata. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very safe. Plus check. Very <laughs> safe. And yeah, metadata is completely checksummed as well. Uh, but the most important thing is that consistency is guaranteed. Um, you know, there's, there is no data placement scenario where you could have a write be acknowledged and then have a failure and then come back up and read the old data. Uh, that is guaranteed and that's obviously very important. Okay, so let's see what other things here we need to talk about. I'm gonna skip over libscribe and just talk directly about the, the QEME block driver because this is really the component that lets us integrate as a native block device that is supported by QEMU KVM. Um, you know, this essentially lets us be uh, directly integrated on the command line. You can do a QEMU image convert from QCOW2 to scribe and it's just, it's, it works, it's just supported. Um, so all those command line tools suddenly just support scribe and that uh, makes it very nice, makes it very easy for us. Additionally, uh, our management API is very simple. Um, it gives us a seamless tie-in with our orchestration layer that we talked about earlier. It's all Thrift-based. Thrift is a technology that was developed uh, by Facebook. It's part of the Apache project, uh, but it gives, uh, there's a really nice IDL that you define your APIs and then you can uh, build Python bindings, C bindings, all these sorts of things. So, uh, you know, from a standpoint of if, if we wanted to write tools in Python or whatever for Scribe, that would uh, be very trivial to do. Uh, and then we also have a rich set of command line tools, um, which I don't know that I'll have time to show you here, but uh, <coughs> we can certainly talk about it later. So with that, that concludes uh, my presentation. So, uh. Ever get people who are confused with the other scribe, the Facebook scribe that works with Facebook Thrift? You know, we actually didn't even know about that when we named <laughs> this drive. But uh, yeah, it's like a logging. Did get confused by <laughs> that? They didn't get confused by that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it, 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 I hadn't heard of it prior to that, and I think it's a, it's, it's a logging aggregator or something along mm -hmm. those lines, yeah. And so it, um, you know, we certainly haven't run into it. It's, it's not a, yeah, it's probably device, not something so that, yeah. that your target market uses exactly. much, but you know, I've, <laughs> yeah. so, so far, I've, yeah. I've worked for smaller companies that use it. I, yeah currently kind of do. Um, Interesting, yeah. No, no namespace collision so far, but uh, we'll see. I've, you know, I've, I've had three o'clock calls about scribe demons, and it's a much <laughs> different problem. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. Good. Thank you. <laughs>